realize this is the after lunch slot. This is when you all fall asleep. So we have to combat that. Yeah? We want something to bring us together. Yeah? Yeah, you're, you're expecting it. Everyone stand up. Come on, let's stand up. Come on. Now, I'm going to keep an eye on those that are standing up. Mark, yes. Right. Okay, now, what I want you to do is I want you to put your hands together like this. Okay? And I want you to jump up and down. Come on, let's go. Now, let's all shout. I'm jumping like a bunny. I'm jumping like a bunny. Yeah, great. Great. Right, you can sit down now. We're going to start proceedings. Now, well, this is my idea, so if it falls flat in its face, don't blame the ladies. Okay, so we're going to introduce panelist by panelist in awkward, cringeworthy ways. So first up, we're going alphabetical by first name. So that's Amy. Now, no, whoa, don't, still, don't, don't go yet, sorry. So this is the AHDB force of nature, the mindset queen. Check out her podcast, especially episode one. Think outside the box. Oh, no, outside the fence. Right, okay. Here we go. Amy Hughes, ladies and gentlemen, let's, come on. Okay, next up, vet, Nuffield Scholar, Scouser. <laughs> she freely admits in her spare time, she fiddles with poo. Yes, it's clear, Jobby Jabber Whittle! <laughs> okay, next up, my nemesis. She, 140 characters are her sword. <laughs> Social media is her battlefield. She stands up for you guys. The regenerative biodiversity Boudicca, <laughs> Nikki Oxall. <laughs> now, I have been listening to this lady's book and it is so, it's a deep dive into farming and to farmers, and it provided me with so much clarity. Books are available at the back. Uh, we've got Sarah, she no longer wears a wig, honest, Langford. Okay, so remember, it's about change, not the change, about change. So we're splitting it up into three, yeah? And first of all, we're gonna talk about what do we want to change to? And I want, and I've kind of briefed them, I don't think they read the email, but I've kind of briefed them that we want to think industry terms and personal terms. And vision is such an important thing, isn't it? Vision is a pool to where we go. So I would like to start off Alpha, no, not alphabetically. With <laughs> that face, I can. But Claire, what do you think? Have you got a vision for what change you would like to see? I have a two page vision. I'm a bit of an idealist, so bear with me. And I don't know if these girls are going to like it, but anyway. So, in 10 years' time, I live in Barbie land. It is a democracy run by women for the benefit of all humankind. It's a nurturing and feminine place, a mother earth, if you will. Nikki here is President Barbie, Sarah, Policy Barbie, and Amy, Implementation Barbie. <laughs> and you would not believe the pace of change because shit just got done. <laughs> we have Kens. Kens are men, globally, that have stopped telling us what to do, how to behave, and they've listened. Whoa, 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 whoa. <laughs> no, sorry, carry on. Okay. I am 
Asian farmer, Barbie. Niche. Note, I am not vet Barbie, because we don't need vets anymore. And I genuinely believe if we were doing our job properly, you wouldn't need vets. I don't need to go out in the night to carve cows because we focus on the right breeding. So I don't have to pull two big calves out of two tight holes. Your grazing management is so spot on that I don't have to dispense wormers anymore. You guys are farming. You planted trees in your boggy bits and the increase in biodiversity, sorry. <laughs> that is not a euphemism. <laughs> But you do get an uplift in biodiversity. Um, <laughs> it means that fluke and ticks um, aren't a problem anymore. You don't need hormones to get your cows pregnant because they're not pumping out so much milk that they're walking on a metabolic knife edge. The vet practice model based on the sales of antibiotics no longer exists, and I tell no lies here. For a while, people paid for my time and my expertise. I wasn't just a cost. Research was done on the benefits of biodiversity for animal health, of trees, plants, and other species that act as medicines, and the research was fully funded because it was important, not because it was paid for by Big Pharma with a product to sell. You guys stepped up, you did the research on your farms, you tried, you failed, and you tried again until you got it. I found myself dispensing medicinal hedgerows, herbal lays, and willow coppices to protect against um, parasites for your livestock. Planting in field trees to protect against heat stress, working on improving your dung beetle numbers rather than dispensing chemical wormers that kill them. I trained you all, and then bit by bit, you came to me less, and you passed the information amongst yourselves. The Regen Vet says, meadow sweet's really high in salicylin. We've planted some around our carving paddocks. You say your flies are really bad under the trees. Well, you need more than two trees in a field, so they don't all gather under the same two. So in the end, I get to farm. My dream. Nikki Oxel's made that possible. I can just pick up the phone and get land. Don't even need to think about it. So I've got me, my perfect herd of English longhorns, and maybe a Ken. Right, Claire's ruined it for everyone else. Okay, who's going to be brave enough? To Amy? No. <laughs> What do you think? Are you Amy? Yeah, well, shit. I wish I'd written something funnier. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, this is something that I've done a massive 360 on, not just since listening about Barbie World, like a few years ago. But, I mean, once upon a time, my vision would have been, like, technology, textbook, let's do everything efficiently, let's, like, innovate on it. Total 360, it's, and in the interest of being touchy-feely, my vision for the industry is just to be working with people that want to farm and that are happy doing it and know exactly why they want to do it. They've got a real clear vision, clear goal, know exactly why they want to farm because change will never happen if we're always changing for somebody else. We've got to be changing for ourselves. And it just, it makes me really, really sad. I come across it all the time. I spend a lot of time stood at bars with farmers, as some of you might know. And it's amazing what you find out when somebody's had a couple of pints and you realize actually how bloody unhappy they are doing what they're doing. And it's just heartbreaking life. Farmers farming is too hard a job to be doing it if you don't want to do it. And, you know, it's taking up space for people that want to come in and, and want to do it. And, yeah, so I just want farmers to be doing it for themselves and, and, and happy doing it, basically. Cool. We'll come to how that can happen in the next section, maybe. Okay, Nikki. Uh, I really don't have anything to add to any of what you've said that would be anywhere near as articulate, eloquent, or, yeah, impassioned. Uh, Claire, that was phenomenal. And Amy, you're right, like, that ability to change, I think, is, yeah, I've gone through a similar uh, process in the last kind of couple of years, um, just making the effort to go and talk to farmers who farm in a completely different way to me, um, and who farm to all intents and purposes in, the, in contradiction to how I think farming should happen. Um, and it's really shifted my um, my vision for the future, I guess, is, uh, because of that. And so everything that Claire said, and um, the thing that I have really loved to see over the last year is being sent um, being sent videos of farmers proud of their orchids, and farmers proud of their hedgerows, and farmers proud of birds that they've seen or plants that they don't know. And for me, uh, my vision would be that that's just really normalised, and that we re 
rekindle this knowledge that has been lost over two generations of the plants, the flowers, knowing that Meadowsweet has those properties, but knowing what Meadowsweet is and being able to identify that. Um, and for that not to be a kind of, there's a weird kind of machismo that stops people sharing that stuff. And I would love to see that end because actually it enables people to not feel shitty about themselves. Sorry, the first swear word of the panel, but um, it's yeah. Not, like, it's is it not? Oh, that's fine. Um, <laughs> clearly wasn't listening, was I? Um, but yeah, like we, there is too much judgment and negativity that is caused by this weird bravado machismo that actually stops people from making progress because they're going to be viewed as a bit soft or you know not not a proper farmer. And my vision would be that that would end. And the way to make that end is just to live in Claire's world, essentially. I think. But would you be head of Barbie Land? Is that? Yeah, totally. Would you take it on? Yeah, of course. Take on the mantle. <laughs> so I was really happy this morning when I saw Nikki's hair because it looks so president. I am like. <laughs> Maggie <laughs> <laughs> it's all about the volume. Right, right, Sarah, your turn. Okay, well, I'm going to give a politician's answer. It's not answer the question, but answer what I want to answer. So Great. I sign up to um, everyone else's vision of the industry. And so what I'm going to give you is the vision of how the industry has connected to the rest of the world. So I sign up to going in to have my hair cut and the hairdresser starts talking to me about soil properties and where they bought their bread from. Or I go to a party in a grey concrete city and look up and all the roofs are covered with grass roofs and AstroTurf has been banned. And in the back garden, people are growing their own vines and vegetables. And then when I get to the party that I'm going to, rather than glaze over when I'm into my hour and a half worth of retex dates, the other people at the table start talking to me about what composting they've been doing with their waste. And then they start talking to me about the farmers that they have come to know, that they visit and buy food from, and the names of those farmers, and what they have learned from them, not just about where their food comes from, but how to have a life of purpose and meaning and connection. And so rather than just focusing on this industry, I think the vision for me is that this industry joins up to all of the other industries and shows what it can teach them about how the world will be. Awesome. <laughs> right, let's dig a little deeper. Yeah? Oh, <laughs> Is that deep enough, Sarah? <laughs> right. I mean, what with the bouncing? All the rumours of a cult are likely to start becoming true in a minute. I'm regretting it now. I shouldn't have worn a blue shirt. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right. Okay, so we want to embrace change. Yeah, so... Um, What's your attitude to change? Because I think, obviously, that it's like when facing progress, we're going to have to embrace change in some way or form. Or form. Claire, you had something. Now, have you got, how many pages have you got in this? Uh, another two. Right. Uh, okay. But I won't, I won't say it all in one go. Well, but I hate change. You hate change. Uh, on the whole, I hate change. Because I am, an, I'm a routine person, so I like, Things just go along as they always do. I don't like it when like people leave work and there's like a hole and you've got more to do, that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm suspicious of it. It makes me really, I get really anxious. And I think that's probably about loss of control potentially. I like, and I think there's types of change because like I like good change, like hopeful change. We had this discussion, didn't we, a little bit. But I hate bad change. <laughs> I know that's how it, but I'm just going to give you an example of bad change. This is a light-hearted one. But yesterday, I had an orange club. All the biscuits are available. Now, I don't know how many of you have had clubs over the years, but you used to be able to bite the chocolate off from around the outside in chunks. Now you, like, lick it and it's gone. Right. <laughs> now, there's, there's two aspects of this, and there's two things I've been told. And they both make me, well, potentially. But number one is that your hands are bigger like I'm nearly 40 years old my hands haven't changed that much since I was 20 I wasn't a child so now you've made me suspicious do you work for McVitie's it also it's for your own good like because it's smaller it has less calories so now you've made me anxious because you've diverted the problem and you've made it about my weight like that isn't supposed to happen so small clubs are a bad change now they're not life-threatening but like insect decline is so, like, less bugs. Great bridge. <laughs> so, and just bear with me. Bear with me. 
There's less bugs on my windscreen when I'm driving. Now you can tell me it's because my car's more aerodynamic, but I do trust my gut and science. And we know it's bad and we know it's changed. So I guess my attitude now is how do you turn bad change around and how you stepped into doing that? So if you told me 10 years ago that an insect that spends its entire life in shit would change the course of my entire life, I would not have believed you, but that actually did happen. So I read a book, which some of you all read, which is Wilding by Isabella Tree. And in that book, it said that we have dung beetles in the UK and that veterinary products kill them. And nobody had told me. And I was dispensing ivermectin like sweets, mate. Throw them out. <laughs> um, <laughs> do you know, like, I mean, it was probably guilt, to be honest. Overall, that caused that initial change. Horrendous guilt. But yeah, it's, that is, I would say that is my attitude to change. Is how do you... How do you change something? How do you make it different? And the reality is, I mean, I can, the, what annoys me the most, and I think Rob's here as well, he'll agree with me, I can only dispense or dis prescribe licensed drugs for treating things like worms, which are things like ivermectins. I mean, the very fact that that's even a thing makes me a bit sick. Why has no one told, why has no one told us that these, about these drugs and their unintended consequences? So the only thing you can do is try and, I don't want to sound cheesy and say be the change. That's disgusting, isn't awesome. it? <laughs> yeah. I love cheesy. Great. But yeah, um, that's me. No, you've got to say it. No, you've got to say it. Be the change you wish to see in the world. <laughs> Let's just pause a moment. <laughs> right. Okay, that's great. Amy, do you want to go next or do you want to rest? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> well, not that, not like I need a rest. No, okay. so <laughs> I, what interests me about you is that you spend your life, your professional life, trying to change, make change possible for farmers. Mm. And there's a, there'll be a resistance to that. And what do you think is the key to change and, you know, embrace, uh, getting farmers to embrace it? Yeah, so yeah, I do spend a lot of time trying to get people to change. And I've, I've changed, changed tact in the way that I do that, but I'll, I'll maybe come back to that. But in my experience, on my observation, people shy away from change the most when it really threatens their identity. So let me give you an example. I, I think that's why we've got so much criticism within our own industry, so much farming across walls and, you know, what they're doing it like that for. Because when they see somebody doing something different, they go home and it doesn't fit with how they think they are. But the problem with that is that those people, nine times out of ten, have no idea why they're farming or what they're doing it for. They're just doing it because they've always done it that way. They've no idea what their own identity is. So it's, yeah, it's just judgment. And, and we have to change this narrative of we're always going to have legislation, rules and regulations in this industry. But we still have to feel in control. We still have to be in the driving seat. And it's, it's how can we still tick the boxes for all the legislation, but farm in a way that fits with what we think and how we think we should be farming so you know it, it's, it's really hard to reach people because quite rightly so I don't farm why the chuffing hell are you going to listen to me about farming however I have been through significant change and that is you know I've now jumped off the technical bandwagon that I once was on I once wanted to be Liz Jennifer the ex the technical expert oh my god yeah no <laughs> And no offence, Liz, but, you know, I'm all right now, thank you. So, <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's the people side of things that, I, that really... And I, I, yeah, and I think it's since I've had kids. Sorry, ladies, I'm getting a puppy. Please remember that. I'm going to talk about my kids, though, for two minutes. When I had kids, uh, I had two in very quick succession, 12-month carbon interval. And um, <laughs> I... <laughs> yeah, exactly. Practicing what I preach. And so I only, only had like six weeks back at work. I was off work for the best part of two years. And when I came back, I was shit scared of being seen as just a mum. Absolutely terrified of it. So I went in all guns blazing, made myself very ill in the process of it. Um, and it was, it was really, really difficult for me to admit that I enjoyed being a mum. That sounds obscene. I hate saying it out loud. But it did because it just did not fit with my identity before I had them. I was like Mrs. Career Woman. And that all changed. So getting through that and actually admitting to people, and ver not just in your own head, you've got to verbalise it. You've got to, you know, I want to work slightly less. I want to spend time with my kids. That was huge, huge for me. And I'm sure it is for any every parent, but I, hellfire did I struggle with it. So 
I was, uh, has anybody watched that documentary on Netflix, The Art of Not Giving a FCUK? It's a book as well, yeah? So he talks under there, uh, in there about that it takes a certain amount of pressure to form a diamond. And hell did I put myself under pressure. Nowhere near a sodding diamond yet, but, you know, might be soon. So it is, it's, it's hard. It's really hard, but um, it is all about that, making, empowering people and making them feel like they're in the driving seat. And it's all right to say what you want. You don't have to farm because it's always been done that way or because, who's the Prime Minister? Rishi Sunak says that, <laughs> says that you have to or death road. <laughs> you know, it, it's your farm, it's your business. Make it work for you. So it, it's a narrative that needs to change massively. So that was how, yeah, maybe we'll come back. How did it end? So this challenge that you had, being Miss career, Mrs. Career Woman and then Mum, and then back into a career, and how did it And Did you just find balance? That was basically it. Yeah, I, I had to. I had to. Like, I wasn't well after. I had horrible personal depression after having Arthur, so I wasn't well. So, you, yeah, you just... It was, it was a breaking point, which I don't think you always have to get to, but it was a, you know, I just have to, I just have to. And it is, it is a practical thing as well. It's literally about finding how it works. You've got a trial and error, time planning and all the rest of it. But it, yeah, it came to it. And I, and I still, I don't think, still don't think I'm there yet. I still put too much pressure on, but we will get there. Yeah, you don't want to start a podcast. Uh, we, yeah, that'll just add to it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right, Sarah, you have the mic. What? I do. I mean, I was going to sort of say all that. No, the idea of judgment is huge because, I mean, I spent 10 years literally in the court of judgment. And whether that makes people, well, I'm absolutely um, sure that it doesn't make people change that particular, any kind of judgment. Um, and I've seen both in my own family and friends growing up and what we're trying to do now, that the only way that you get people to move with you is without judgment. And through the telling of stories, I believe, that the telling of stories, the ability for somebody else to put themselves in the shoes of someone they've never met and walk that life with them, I think is really powerful because I think we've always told stories to each other about the world and how it works. But I will just kind of pick up on what Amy said now about reaching rock bottom. Because when I look at the people that I represented who would go through a cycle of imprisonment, for example, like one of my favorite burglars, who was really good fun to hang out with, genuinely, had his own moral code, um, <laughs> didn't do independent shops, only large scale, because no one enjoys working there and they've got insurance anyway. It does actually make sense. Wrote great letters of apology to the judge until he found out that it was the same judge he'd been in front of before and then he'd go, oh no, he's had one of those. <laughs> <laughs> he's a very good example of something that I saw all the time, which is, they, he, I represented him for eight years. And he bounced back and forward. He knew the system better than I could. He'd go, do you know what? If I plead to that, they might, they'll drop that, you know, because they've got the evidence for that, but they haven't got me on CCTV for that one. <laughs> but in the end, it, he, he reached a sliding doors crisis point because he got sent down for something um, really serious that took him would potentially take him out for a long time if he went down. And he, he had what we in the industry call the swerve, <laughs> which is when you're faced with the possibility of your life crashing. And that could be analogous to losing your farm or to a death or a near-death experience or whatever it might be. And a technicality, and I saw it in other cases, a technicality meant that he didn't get what was in front of him. And that was his swerve to change. And I realized it's quite a high risk strategy. <laughs> but I read a report, or someone told me about a report, that 60% of change comes from crisis. I could have got it the wrong way around. 60% of change comes from crisis, and 40% is peer pressure. And I think the combination of the two enables people to think, why am I even doing this anyway? And I agree with Amy there. I think there are three things that basically push you off the diving board of life. One is having kids, one is getting sacked, and one is getting divorced. 
And when you're picking yourself, scraping yourself up off the floor from all those experiences, you think, what do I actually want? Do I want to go back on the same path? Why am I doing this? And a lot of the farmers that I met and wrote about had reached that crisis point where they were about to lose everything and they had to make a choice about where they went next. Otherwise, you're on the hamster wheel. So we have You started <laughs> this. <laughs> yeah, but then, yeah, so you've got to... I, I, I totally get there's so many stories about crises making huge change. I mean, that's a lot of... There's a lot of stories in regenerative farming about that, definitely. What... Why are you laughing? Scooch. Uh, <laughs> she wishes um, to look at him. But then, what... How can you change without that happening? Or is it... Well, maybe that's the peer pressure element of it. If you get enough people, if the, in, if the circumstances, and we're there, right? Loss of BPS, crashing, uh, huge flood events, droughts, crashing biodiversity loss, we're at the crisis point, which is gonna take enough people to that point of change. And then the peer pressure element comes into it, and that's the judgment thing. And I, I was talking about it this morning. I used to be able to drive from London to Suffolk without seeing an animal, just wouldn't see any at all. And in the last couple of years, I've started just going sheep out of the window. It's weird for anyone else in the car. And then the other day, luckily I wasn't driving because I definitely would have crashed the car. And I was like, holy shit, there's a mobile dairy. There's a mobile dairy in that arable field, just there by the road. And... I mean, I don't think that I have ever seen or expected to see a mobile dairy grazing on a lay as part of an arable rotation, as part of enterprise stacking, in our part of the world, which is large, completely stockless arable. It's happening, and luckily, it's happening by the roadside. <laughs> okay, Nikki. Um, well, I love change. But that's maybe because I haven't got children, haven't ever been sacked, and haven't got divorced. <laughs> Yet. Yeah, there's still time. James has left, so maybe I should bring him and get his feedback about what he thinks. But um, yeah, so I really love change. I absolutely love it. Um, I think it's because I don't have very good dopamine regulation because I have ADHD. So it's a kind of a, uh, I get uh, a kick from change and feeling kind of a bit out of control. Um, so that's slightly concerning probably but <laughs> I love it um, and it's so for me the idea of change and doing things differently and you know it's why at 37 I've had um, three careers I mean it's just bonkers isn't it I shouldn't be this young and be in kind of my third career um, all three of which have been pretty successful that sounds a bit big-headed but I'm not going to apologize for it because they have been um, so, <laughs> so yeah um, but yeah, you know, and I th like having the ability just to drop something and pick something else up is something I've really enjoyed. And because I like change, I've always been a bit of a, um, I guess I've got a reputation as being a bit of a, um, oh, I don't know, kind of a bit of a zealot, a bit kind of, you know, at the extreme. No. Do you know what? <laughs> you know, there's this expectation that, and, and I suppose it's quite a good place to position yourself, isn't it, at an extreme? Because it means that people want to argue with you. And that also gives me an adrenaline kick. So it's another way that I get my dopamine fix. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, there's this assumption um, that, that I kind of have this particular way of being or thinking and that, you know, I'm a bit of a hippie and that I, you know, think that we should all go around stroking our cows and giving them all names and, and never thinking about kind of anything other than um, touchy-feely stuff and, you know, less of the efficiency. And actually... Uh, that isn't the case and the thing that has really what I've realized is that everybody's perception is their reality so other people's perception of me is their reality about how I behave and how I think so I will be considered to be a bit too hippie or a bit weird or a bit like yeah just too extreme for them to engage with and so in terms of kind of engaging with other people in a process of change I mentioned it a minute ago about, you know, kind of putting myself out in situations where I felt uncomfortable and I wasn't in my kind of normal comfort zone going on to, you know, so I work for Pasture for Life and I was putting myself uh, to go and visit 100%, um, well, like zero grazing dairy farms where the animals never went outside ever. Like complete anathema to how I 
believe and would ever want animals to be treated doesn't mean that that's wrong but what was really important was that I was engaging with that now that person isn't going to change if I turn up on their farm and go well this is rubbish and all your cows look miserable and you should just do what I say because no one is ever ever going to respond to that so and they probably maybe they're not going to change but I think just if you if you become a personality who other people expect something of you the best thing that you can do is do the unexpected and I think sometimes that allows people and gives them permission also to change because they see if you can change, maybe they can also change. And that is getting a little bit, I don't know, philosophical. But I think it is, it is true that if people see that you can moderate how you think or you can change what your experience and you can be open about that. And you can say, you know, I used to think feedlots were really awful places until I went in and visited some. And actually, you know, the guy that runs this feedlot um, not a million miles from here, has become a really good pal, and we um, quite often share whiskey drinking tips and uh, recommend Netflix series to each other. And actually, you take out that power struggle of, I believe in 100% pasture-fed beef, he believes in whatever his system is. You take that away, and you, you get to a very personal level. And, and actually, the next stage in, in kind of that shift is being very public about that. And, and sort of sharing with each other and more publicly and widely to disrupt what other people's perception of you is. And I think that's the thing. If we can demonstrate that we can go through change and we can experience change and we can be okay with it, whether we're terrified of it or not, I think it gives other people, even subconsciously, like a switch to go, oh, okay, change is all right. We don't have to nail our colors to the mast and only ever follow that route. We can do something a bit differently. Sorry, I rambled there a bit. Not at all. I tell you, you... You are definitely a disruptor, Nikki, and I, and it makes people uncomfortable. It's for a really good, yeah, it's for good. I feel so. Anyway, I just wanted to sh share Thanks. that with you. Thanks. <laughs> but don't don't question Lyme applications again. Right now. Waste of money. Okay, waste so. of money. What you need is adapted cattle, because then you don't need to oh. worry about your productive grasses. Right. So, I think Amy would agree with me on that. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <no. laughs> right now okay now i've got the last thing is chal the challenge of change so barriers to change claire we talked about this beforehand yeah. you want to you've had a lot of challenge i just talk about them a lot <laughs> well, <I'm not. laughs> uh, well i wasn't going to talk i had two things to talk about here and one was a bit more light-hearted but uh Nikki and Amy have both gone quite deep and quite personal, so I'm going to crack on with that. And it kind of follows on from what Nikki was saying. And just bear with me with the story, but it's a little bit about language around change, how we speak to people, communication, and about finding a community. But some changes are devastatingly, heartbreakingly life-altering, and they're sudden, and they're unexpected, and they have outcomes that you could never have possibly predicted. So... Some of you all know this, some of you won't, but I had a hysterectomy in April this year. I was diagnosed with cervical cancer in March. And I don't want to say much more than that, other than if you're worried about your bits, just go and get them checked. Like I, as someone who spends her time in shoulder deep in vaginas, they are all weird and wonderful and beautiful and unique, and you have nothing to worry about. So just go to the doctors. Um, <laughs> but... The point was, something happened after that. So I've always said I never wanted children. I was absolutely 100%. And then something about having my uterus removed changed that. And I don't... Fucking hell. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, the, I think the answer's still the same. But... And I'm not apologising for crying. I'm going to come on to this. Um, it made me think about it an awful lot, which I hadn't done before. And... You know, I'm never going to be able to do that. I made a decision when I was younger. I think I'm okay with it. And I'll get there. But the point is, I was really sad. And I was really angry. And I was really frustrated about it. And nobody said the right fucking thing. Everyone wanted to be positive. And I'm on my second round of therapy now. And my therapist said to me on the phone one day, why do you keep saying sorry for crying? Why do you keep saying sorry for crying? And that is the thing, isn't it? We, we've been taught sort of societally and culturally that sadness and grief and anger are bad emotions to have around change. 
And we really all need to get better at not only feeling into our emotions ourselves, but allowing people to be exactly as they are. Like, I don't want to be fixed. People don't want to be fixed. They just want someone to listen to them. And I think that's really important when we come to talking about change. And I, I used to think I always had to be happy. Um, but for most people, it's not realistic. Grief and sadness and anger, they're woven into our lives in lots of ways. And they live alongside each other. And you find home in grief, you find home in sadness. You can't make it better, you can't make this better for me. It never will be, but I will find a way of living there. And I just want you guys to observe that, to validate it. Um, so finding this community of people who really validated my feelings was the most helpful thing. People who didn't turn away from how I'm feeling. Seeing another human in pain or sadness is really, really difficult and we can't help but want to make that better. But we don't have to fix it. And we unintentionally make people feel bad when we do try and do that because they then want to be happy in your presence when they don't have to be. We can't change how people feel, but we can change how we respond to their behavior and we can allow them to just be. Um, I guess validation's key and that's all anyone really wants. And people feel the way they do and there's often nothing you can do about it, but they just want to be heard. And in trying to enact systems change and going back to what Nikki said, validation of what anyone does, what anyone thinks, whatever their behavior is, eventually leads to far better collaboration than just being right. So what I'm saying is when it comes to change, feel into your emotions, allow others to do the same and find a community of people to lean on and who will allow you to just be you and the positives will just flow. <laughs> oh, right. Is it, but it's, it's a little tiny question and such a big thing that you've said, but as a person that you are explaining your pain to, is, is it as simple as listening? Or is it, it is literally just listen. Like, we, we spent... We spend a lot of time trying to, and I do it as well, you know, you want to, so some people, someone tells you something and then you come back with something similar because you want to empathize with that person. But actually everybody's grief is completely different and people will feel differently about it. You know, whether people have lost a child or whether they've had a divorce or all of those things, that are, everyone lives in their own separate grief, but trying not to compare yours to others is really important. Just having someone listen to what you're saying and just say, yeah, it's really, really shit, and that's it. Like, and just listen to that over and over again if it's needed. Just not try, it's that trying to fix something or, or people saying at least. Like, it's like, you know, I lost my grandma last week. Well, she's not, well, you know, good innings. <laughs> she lasted till she was 91. At least she was 91. It's, I mean, it's left a massive hole. Like, you know, it's still not great that she's gone. It's the same for, you know, everyone loses people. But the at least, there's always like a second part to a sentence, isn't there, that remains unsaid. Yeah. Nikki, do you want to...? Not really. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but what, I think what is interesting, actually, and it, I was reflecting when you were speaking, Claire, on something that you said um, earlier as well, Sarah, about peer pressure. And I think there's like an, an opposite side to that, which is, again, this thing about community and support. And I think we in this kind of bubble that we all live in, in our, in our echo chamber of, of kind of agroecology or regen ag or, you know, changing systems, we're all very good at supporting each other and feeling very good that we've got this community. You know, something that Pasture for Life are hugely proud of is the community and the membership and something we talk about all the time. But actually, sometimes I think we forget the power of just one person being your cheerleader um, and just having one person. So if, if somebody who is doing something in a particular way that they're really struggling with or they're finding things hard and they make a change, just being that, being a cheerle 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 being a cheerleader for one person is as powerful as us all kind of being self-congratulatory that we're all sitting here and aren't we good and we're all going in the right direction. And so I think I've kind of 
decided I want to be a cheerleader for people, but not tell other people or even tell them. Like, just be this kind of person, which is quite difficult for me because I'm quite gobby. Um, but sort of, you know, there are a few, few farmers that I've worked with in the last couple of years for whom, you know, they'll, every so often I'll get a message or a phone call that they've tried something different. And like my... I used to want to sort of change the world, but actually just kind of being that supporter and cheerleader for that one, two, three farmers quietly in the background, I think is so much more rewarding. And like, it doesn't need to be shouted about. about. And whether you're a cheerleader or you're the person that just sits there and nods and goes, yeah, it's really shit, isn't it? You know, whether you're kind of just a, a, a person to receive their frustration and anger or whether you're the person that then bounces back with positivity. And I think that, yeah, that's something that I think maybe more of us could try doing, being a quiet cheerleader. Great. Do you want to go? Sarah? I'm going to take it, yeah. I just want to... What Claire said about listening is exactly what I think the process that I saw farmers going through when I was talking to them, because I talked to loads of conventional farmers as well. But the person, obviously, who springs to mind is Uncle Charlie, and he didn't fit, he was really angry. He spent a long time being really angry. And when you drilled it down, that anger all came from a place of feeling like no one was listening. Not really. I mean, he had a column, so some people were listening, but <laughs> not the people that he wanted to listen. Not the people that he wanted to listen. And so I wrote the chapter about him and, you know, it was quite mixed. They used his own words a lot. And I remember feeling physically sick when I sent it to him by email and thinking, well, that's the end of our relationship. There had been quite a few like periods of non-speak already throughout the writing process over the kind of two years beforehand. And then I called him up and there was a few like, have you read it yet? And I called him, he went, I love it. I thought I did not expect that at all. But what he loved is that someone had heard him out, someone had listened to his arguments, and then they put it in a way that was gonna reach people that was outside of his circle. And, I mean, it's the same as the clients I represented as well, of course, but this idea of just listening to people without judgment is critical for change. Yeah. yeah. Amy, you're up last. Yeah, it's, it's... Make it good. It, oh, God. It's, um, <laughs> I'm joking. It's, it's like uh, we've actually discussed this before we've done it because the, the two of the things that I've got written down are, are building your community and, and listening. Um, you know, I, I don't claim to have had much of an impact on anybody, but the people that, that I do know that I've helped change it has literally just been a case of listening and providing a, a non-judgmental space, you know, not offering advice. And when they're finished telling me whatever they want to tell me, what, what do you want to do about it and how can I help you? Um, and you know, that comes from, I can't, I know it's my job, but I can't advocate discussion groups enough. Like there's a few of my uh, farmers in here that have been in my discussion groups and that, that without doubt, the best bit of those discussion groups are the time at the bar. But they are where you all get together and you just talk about what's going on. And um, you know, you've got to build that community around you because it, it, it's not a weakness to ask for support. It's, hum it's human. We are all biologically programmed to, and neurologically programmed to want that support. So it's not a weakness, and, but it's, you know, picking your support. I um, was very late to the party with the whole Brené Brown thing. I think she's bloody amazing. But after that, I have, I have a rule now that if, if you are not courageous and brave and get your ass kicked and fail on occasion, couldn't give a shit what you think about me and my life. Like that, there are too many people like that in our industry that will judge and critique and then go home and just do the same old crap that they've always done. So, but what you have to remember is it, they're always going to be about, but you don't have to take that on board. You don't have to take those thoughts or those voices on board. Um, and then the one other thing that I had written down about the challenges of change was um, I was really lucky. I got to go to America in May and I visited a farmer called Jerry Doan and he said to me something that like I say to myself at least once a day now, we are taught to think in black and white and we are, the whole world is. That's how our education systems run, it's how our universities run. And we've gotta, we've gotta, I don't know how, change that somehow, we've gotta start thinking in systems because it's why we've ended up as an industry where we are getting the finger pointed at us. We change one thing at once. The KE is the same, all KE across industries is the same. Let's look at this one technical aspect. Let's not 
give a toss what people think. Let's not give a toss what it does to X, Y, and Z. Let's just focus on this one thing. And then we wonder why people don't change because they go home and try it and it cocks a load of other stuff up and it isn't really what they want to do. And so what's the point? Like the technical bit is the easy bit. We've got the information to change. We've got the technical information. We've got to get the people bit right. Otherwise we're just bloody flogging a dead horse with it. Brilliant. Boom. Yeah, <laughs> you can drop the mic now. Right, we've got a few minutes for questions. Have you got any questions? There's a gentleman over here. <laughs> run, 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 run. Um, I think quite a lot of people are here because they have already decided to make a change or perhaps were lucky enough to you know, have taken over uh, an enterprise that had already made a change. And how do we, or, the, or anyone interested in this, manage to keep their opinions and identity fluid enough that sort of regenerative or sustainable or conservation or, or what any, any of the words you want to describe with changes in farming don't just become monolithic like conventional farming has been so that the people who are innovating today don't, aren't followed by uh, children or successors who aren't capable of innovation themselves? Um, I think that, that's a really good point because a lot of people 30 years ago would have thought they were innovating and now we're all kind of rolling our eyes about whatever it is they were doing because of, you know, it's just so conventional and it just isn't the, the, the right thing that they should be doing. You know, and we all get holier than now and then we get stuck in these paradigms. Um, and I definitely have gone through that process, like with mob grazing, for example, and like moving animals every day and this is what had to happen and it had to be like this. And, um, and then actually realizing that completely gets in the way of just being human and, you know, all these other systems and ways of thinking around it. So I think one of the things that I really recommend is, um, well, holistic management, mostly because it was life changing for me. So as a, a practice, it's about identifying where you want to go. Um, and like what you want to achieve, what you want your life to look like. And so it kind of doesn't really matter what label you put on that as, oh, I want, you know, I'm regenerative or I'm this or I'm that. It's, just, it's actually what do you want, what do you want your day to look like? And that kind of, I think that makes a difference. If you're just very clear with how do I want my life to be? How do I want each day to look? How do I want each week to look? That makes a massive difference. Um, and then I think the, the other thing is that, um, like, Carol Dweck's work on growth mindset, I don't know if any of you are aware of that, and this kind of comes to my background in education, um, is brilliant. This idea of like the kind of plasticity of our neural networks and the ability to change. And so always thinking about, you know, rather than saying, well, I can't speak German, you would say, well, I can't speak German yet. And, you know, it's that openness and willingness to change. And I think, yeah, if you're interested in, in how do you maintain neural plasticity and openness, then Carol Dweck's work is, you know, from on a, on a very individual basis, I think is an interesting thing to do. What we can't do is tell people how they should think, and actually all we can do is take responsibility for our own thinking and our own behaviors and, the, and, and our, so I think, rather than worrying about how do we stop everybody from becoming kind of too fixed on regenerative, our best bet is to think, how can I stop myself from being too rigid in my beliefs and how can I maintain an openness and a willingness to learn? And if we all do that, then we've solved the problem, haven't we? Because we're all being more open. That makes sense. Anyone else? I think you got it, mate. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I was, yeah, exactly what Nikki said about mindset, but curiosity as well. Like if I think we teach the next generation to be curious and non-judgmental, they'll, they'll find their own way. They'll, they'll continue to just naturally look for, for different ways of doing it. And it might be that those different ways aren't the right way, but it, you know, if you don't look, you're not going to find, are you? So it is it, totally mindset. Couldn't agree more. Uh, Joel Salton had something on his farm where his kids, all of his kids got to start their own business on the farm. That was really cool. So, and then they could carry it on when they were older and then all of his grandkids had done the same thing. And there was all of these little businesses that all belonged to someone, there was someone's responsibility. Um, and that was really interesting for giving people a bit of innovation like for the next generation. Sarah, have you got, shall we move on or? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> no, okay, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I'm clearly the not very clever one because I'm not sure I totally understood the question. Is it like how you stop the next generation from, how you stop Regentive being a fixed product that can then just be copied and I think in its very essence it's impossible to make it a fixed product because it's adaptive and it changes. So if you're doing it 
in its truest sense, then it cannot be. Have I understood the question right? Okay, good. That's a good answer. Right, um, one last question. Yeah. Is this how girls talk all the time? <laughs> and I how don't many daughters know. have you got, Paul? Yes. Uh, we're women. Try it. Try again. <laughs> Paul, run. <laughs> so, so I think my original question before that just popped into my head was... Um, is farming doomed because it's run by boys? Boys. It's a nice recovery. <laughs> I uh, found it, especially in the space of arable, impossible, impossible not to see arable farming as, excuse my French, but I feel like we've already all gone there, a giant cock-off where I was the only woman in the yard and something massive and shiny would drive in and everyone I was with would just migrate to it and start wanting to look like they wanted to lick it. And <laughs> it was extraordinary. And I heard stories of kind of people who would spray the three tram lines nearest the road with an excellent nitrogen. So those stalks in the most obvious symbolism possible would grow stiffer and taller than the rest. <laughs> And yes, that's kind of the conclusion I came to, which was also supported a bit by the fact that in so many of the farmers I met, it was so often the wife doing her own work behind the scenes. And it is still usually that way around, certainly in farming communities, who would say, we can't, because they knew the numbers when their husbands probably didn't need numbers because they usually did all the paperwork and the books. And they were the ones behind the scenes kind of working to change it and understanding it. So making farming, taking the toxic masculinity out of farming, I think would be a really good way to supercharge this, yes. I'm gonna jump, I'm gonna jump onto that because I can't help myself. Um, <laughs> and I think that's a really key word, it's about masculinity and like masculine energy, not necessarily about men. And I talk a lot, you know, I kind of bang on on Twitter every so often, go off on one about the patriarchy, which isn't about men, it's about kind of masculine control and and I think there's a that people get confused about you know people who challenge patriarchy are men haters and that's not the same thing and women can be actors of the patriarchy as well sorry this is getting a little bit I'm going off on one but I think it's that thing about energy it's about masculine energy or controlling or domineering energy um, and actually what we need more of we've talked you know I think all of us have talked about nurturing and supporting and nature um, and those are the sort of energies that we want. So I don't think it matters whether you're male, female, non-binary. I think what matters is the energy that you show up to your business with or that you bring to the party. And if you're coming to the party with a, a doom-mongering, naysaying, control, command and control energy, then and competitive, yeah, and you know, kind of driven by what other people think, then you're probably actually not going to be that successful. And if you are financially successful, there's a high risk if you come into it with that energy, you're not actually going to be that happy. And I think, again, you know, worrying about what other people are doing and, and worrying about how other people are acting within the industry, within the sector, the first thing we all need to do is turn the mirror on ourselves and go, right, how am I behaving and how am I being? And am I turning up with masculine or feminine energy? And I think just being a little bit more introspective and thinking about what we're doing is probably more helpful than casting aspersions about um, what everyone else is doing, whether they're male or female. I don't know, and I don't mean to sound derogatory in saying this, but I think it's really hard for a man, particularly a white man, to understand what it feels like to be... I'm going to see... I'm going to use me as an example. If I turned up on a farm as a new graduate, you would, I would get a very different response to a 50-year-old male vet turning up on a farm to carve a cow. I would always be starting on a back foot from the beginning because there will be prejudgments made about me from a lot of people, not everybody. I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that it's farming's doom because it's run by boys, but I think it has, you know, there is this thing about men have ruled the world and it's not always been good. And it has been about power and it has been about dominance. And that has to change, definitely. Barbie land. <laughs> Thank you.
Amy? Me. Um, is it doomed? I, no, I don't think it is. I don't think it is. I think there's a lot that needs to change. I think, um, I mean, Paul, we've been in, I can't remember where we were, but I can remember you specifically saying men need to talk, no shit, or words to that effect. Like, it's, 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 it's daft with that. That narrative needs changing across the whole society, not just, not just farming. And I think it's, you know, it's down to the, those of us that are parents to make sure our kids know and feel that it's okay to talk about what they want to talk about and the, you know, what they want in life. And it, it's something that's got to change generally. Um, but there's no doubt that women bring a, a totally different element I'm talking about discussion groups now. They do. They they men will talk more when women are about 100%, which is sad, really. But it is, you know, it's a thing. So no, I don't think we're doomed. But there's a lot to there's a lot of work to be done in that respect, definitely. Okay, that's it. I'll finish with a song. <laughs> I'm just Ken. Anywhere else I'd be a ten. Sorry. Right. <laughs> Thanks so much. Give it up for our four amazing panelists. It's the best panel I've ever been part of. Thank you so much, ladies, women. Okay. <laughs>